Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Through Conversations podcast. This is round two with the amazing Jacob Lund Fisker, the author of Early Retirement Extreme. If you haven't watched our first conversation, I'm going to put the link below so you can go through it. We explore an amazing array of ideas from financial independence to what it means to be actually free to how to become more resilient in today's world. And today with Jacob, I would love to dive deep into, you know, what, how is the game of the economics looking, how finance for oneself can be more resilient too, and what does virtuosity mean actually in today's world? Because we see so many virtue signalers out there, but what does it mean to be virtuous? So that being said, Jacob, thank you for, for joining me today. Well, thank you for having me back again. <laughs> yeah, really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your book, Early Retirement Extreme, and your ideas from our last conversation really have stuck up with me. And, you know, we're living in a weird economic world. It seems that every single indicator, at least in the macrosphere, is pointing towards a potential recession. So I was interested in knowing, Jacob, how can one brace for a potential recession using your ideas, using the early retirement extreme? How can we overcome it? Well, I mean, my approach is, or has essentially been about decoupling from the economy itself, uh, creating slack between my own situation and what the market is doing and what the economy is doing. And it, it really came out of uh, concerns about resource constraints and later uh, climate change. So bigger problems. And But as a side effect of, of, of decoupling and still working a bit, at least for like a <laughs> five to eight years, it eventually turned out I also saved a lot of money because I didn't need them anymore. So um, they're basically, I mean, if you're asking sort of more in, in, in general terms, they are like the hard mode, which we could call ERE, or the early extra retirement extreme approach. And then there's um, a simpler approach. Uh, simplistic mode which you could call like fire the fire movement financial independence retired early and one is money-based and the other one is skill-based and so as I like if you start with the money-based one it is essentially about creating some some financial slack between your spending and your your earning so saving money leaving room in the budget so you can actually cut it like not maxing out all 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 posts, but like um, there, there are different ways of looking at that, and of course uh, increasing one's wealth as well. You know, like if the market drops twenty percent, if those twenty percent will kind of like kill your plants, then maybe have forty percent. Yeah. Um, I think the skill based one is a lot more interesting though, because not because if if, if you focus on like being self reliant instead then you don't just like decouple from whatever the stock market is doing or wherever else you invest it, but what, from what the, uh, the actual uh, e economy is doing, right? So if, if you follow all the, the, the eerie principles about becoming sort of like a multi-skilled multi Renaissance man or Renaissance person, then you don't really need to worry too much about what the economy is doing. I mean, like with the... Um, with like the COVID lockdowns, I mean, for, for us, that was that was almost business as, as usual. I mean, we just kind of like cruised right through it. It was almost sort of like not to be sort of like too dismissive of how, how many people were struggling with, but for us, it was almost like, uh, well, this is what I've been preparing for <laughs> for, the, for, for the past 10 years. And it, and it turned out to sort of like confirm that the ideas were actually working. What is the best way, Jacob, for us to leverage technologies to become more skill resilient in today's world? Well, I mean, if you're specifically talking like computers and, and the internet, I would say that the internet, especially YouTube, strangely, is a, a, a very good resource for learning. Uh, and especially learning to become self-reliant. If, if you need to fix some something, you can probably find someone who shows you how to do exactly that. That's a lot easier than it, it, it used to be where you needed all these handyman manuals. And I mean, even like 
online forums. So typically be people with the same problem, no matter what problem you have, you can find something on Reddit or something like 10 other people have, have found it and, and, and solved it already. Um, I think I think another great thing about the internet was that it allowed people, I mean, this, this, these, these ideas are still kind of like fairly rare in the, in the community and in the world at large, you know, like maybe like 1% or something think about things in this way. Uh, or, or actually strive to become more self-reliant in, in, in that sense. And, you, and you, you can find those people, you know, that's like power in numbers almost. almost. Um, whereas before, you know, like maybe there, was, there would be like a magazine, you could write to the magazine and then three months later, you, maybe a letter would get published, you know, and then you could read an article or, or books. I mean, but so, so that, like the possibility of instant communication is... Is, has made a huge difference and it's probably somewhat underappreciated for, for, for those who essentially have grown up with it. I, I was like right at the edge of it. Mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, I, I, I got on, I got online in, in 1989. <laughs> so <laughs> when one of the first ones of my uh, generation, so to speak. Yeah. That's you, you saw the whole, the whole, emergence of the internet which was really amazing and you say something really crucial which is you know trying to find or rather re leverage our technologies our internet to find more like-minded people striving to become more self-reliant and this is really interesting it reminded me of we were we were talking before recording uh certain recording about a tweet that you sent and that was one that i remembered which was adulting 101 adulting 201 <laughs> It's, really, it's like you say that, you know, finding like-minded people to prepare ourselves. I'm going to put the link in the bio for that tweet for everyone. Who's <laughs> I don't know if it was that clever. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's interesting because, you know, it's finding people who believe in becoming more self-reliant and understanding your ideas can help us prepare the ground and the foundation, a solid foundation for a better 22nd century, which is... You know, I think, I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's interesting to put, I mean, the, I mean, I know that like community colleges and, and other colleges are actually like teaching courses in adulting for like Generation Z and I see yeah, yeah. As, as it is now. And it's, it's, to me, it's absolutely crazy. But there was sort of like this, this gap. Uh, let me put it this way, like, what 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 I am doing and what like ERE self reliance this whole sort of like direction has taken is not really doing anything super complicated in any way. We're basically doing or having or rather we have we, we're rediscovering the attitude that our grandparents have or my grandparents, so like people who were born like a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah, but they were probably like the last generation to 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 actually exhibit those traits. So like I'm Generation X. And the boomer generation, and we know we have to blame boomers for every, everything, right? Uh, but, but I mean, they kind of figured sort of by the 80s and 90s, just when this computer revolution happened, that we should essentially all forget about all this, like, adult thing, thing you know, like, learning how to, like, cook real food, um, how to fix, like, a broken sink, uh, how to uh, change your brakes on your car, all, all that stuff, like, was was essentially... It, it was thought economically more efficient to to outsource it and people would like wave their hands and say, you know, like a, a comparative advantage. And instead we should just teach all these kids to go sit in front of like a computer and learn how to code. Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's really, uh, really what it, what it was. And I think that basically came, came back to bite the the, the following two generations. I mean, when when I was when I was in, in, in like the public K twelve equivalent system, this that stuff was already beginning to be phased out the the old school like like shop class and cooking class in in favor of um, well we should go to the computer lab. They, the school at that time had like one room with like fifteen computers in it. Uh, actually, when I was like uh, eight, the entire school had one Commodore sixty four to share and that like one Commodore 64 would like spend a week in each classroom. Uh, 
but I mean, so 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 now we are sort of like in 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 that where 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 where, where people like are, have have grown up and and they basically don't know anything. I mean, I mean, it's from from all from the perspective of people older than fifty, it's just incredible. Like what what you say, a lot of us really have a struggle in acquiring this reliance skill set, these reliance tools, and understanding that. Part of being alive is learning to be independent and not only, you know, not only thinking that the whole life is around the computers, which, you know, previously we mentioned how we can leverage them, but it's also important to understand that, like you say, that this is not the entire life because like we see a lot of our systems kind of broke and they were rather fragile because we were so immersed into focusing on one specialization, which is technology in a sense, and then just everything else became dependent on the macro sphere, like what you say. It's, it's kind of like the, 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 I mean, they're like two metaphors. I mean, one is like the fish water swimming. Yeah. Or the aquarium, the, it's also like, I don't want to see, say everybody, but like, like especially Generation Set and, and beyond, it has it's, it's like been more like an aquarium. You know, like it, this is the world, right? They, you know, you're in front of a screen constantly. For us, it was more like a pool. You jump into it, but you can also get out of it. And for, for my parents, it's like, what, what do I need this for? You know, like, they, you know, like I can't afford to get wet. I don't want to. Um, so, so it's, 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 it's uh, the other, the other metaphor would be like the tool equivalent. Like, what is the tool actually? And where, where does the tool, the tool to me is like an extension of, of, of the operator. Mm. But where does it begin and where does it end? For example, I mean, I mean, it's, it might be obvious. You could say it's, it stops at the hand, you know, and then it begins there. But that's not really the case. I mean, what if someone has like a prosthetic hand? So, in, in that sense, understanding like where where does the tool end and where does it begin and how does it change the the, the mind space is is um is a big difference i mean it's it's even like a, a communications barrier i mean we keep on on on, on my forum that we keep having this like recurrence of dating discussions you know like online dating and how the young people date and how the old people used to do it and yeah. it's it's very hard to sort of like even connect in my opinion you know like advices that work that you know in this decade doesn't work in the next decade because people's minds have changed so much yeah no it's really interesting that everything that you just said and including you know the the tools when for example a lot of people report that when they forget their phones or they lose their phones they feel as if they lose a part of themselves Right, it's, it's, it's crazy, and you know, there's so much, there's so much to learn there that, you know, we've we've put a lot of of energy towards these technologies that we forget that they're tools in and of themselves rather than a part of us. And like you say, it's it's impossible to really decouple, you know, how many times do I use my phone, my technologies, yeah. and how do, how is it affecting my my wiring my my mind right, right, yeah. how am i associating that with me and my identity and like you say connecting with people online dating you know it's it's also a really interesting phenomenon and some people are really enjoy it some people don't but it's just it's different minds and some minds have really gathered the idea that we are our tools and you know it's it's just really interesting you know we we're seeing ourselves as part of the tools that we use you know the products that we buy and we're forgetting to get closer to the notion that we are an end we ourselves are ends to ourselves not products so you in ere in early retirement extreme you touch on the productization of people the dangers of seeing ourselves as products rather than ends ourselves. So I wanted to touch a, a bit about this notion that how is it that we're seeing ourselves as products and as consumption people rather than seeing each other as ends? 
I mean, once once that happens, I think I mean the the, the problem is that that you to me to me and and this is this is sort of like the water I swim in. Uh, every I'm 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 sort of like a, a, a problem solver that's driven by caffeine. And so, if in, in in terms of problem solving, if, if everything and everyone is is, is seen as, as a product or a, a service, then humans essentially become something you hire and fire. And with problems, uh, I mean, with, with 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 tools, essentially, it's something like buying the best tool. Or always, if you want to fix anything, it's like, okay, what where, where's the tool for that? You know, like. Let's let's have a barbecue. Oh, we don't have a grill, uh, so we must buy a grill instead of thinking. Well, I mean, technically, this is about like heating meat and vegetables on the fire, so maybe I can put together something else for that solution. But this this does not occur to us because we're in this kind of like product product mentality. Uh, if I have a problem, if the if the if the toilet is broken, it's like I don't know why that's my favorite example, but it's very traumatizing when it's not working, right? <laughs> and so the, the <laughs> The, the the solution space is there like call a plumber right yeah uh, I'll call someone and if it doesn't work you know then complain and it's 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 kind of like this like water and fish right it becomes the water that we all swim in and and this is not necessarily a, a problem unless the water goes bad right because then we don't know how to fix it the aquarium fish cannot change their own water. It can only be changed from the outside. And so it's not really a problem, I would say, like with, with capitalism as such. It's it's a problem with how capitalism was implemented by essentially what you could call like mass culture or ma mass consumerism and mass industrialization. And in, in that sense, um, um, Thinking of every everything in terms of products becomes some kind of like um, a choice architecture. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. Yeah, okay, no. Nope. Um, it, it basically, um, it, it, I mean, the, the, the best way to I think reduce it is is like the Henry Ford saying you can have like any any Model T car as long as it's you, have, you can have it like in any color as long as it's black, mm -hmm. right? So, it kind of gives the illusion that you actually have choice, but you don't. It's like when you go in, in, in into the supermarket and you want to buy a can of tomato. You know, they have like 40 different kinds, but it's all the same tomato, right? It's just different labels, right? Um, and the same thing with our solution space. I mean, you can have, there's like this choice architect. You have like the solution of this. You have infinite freedom. You can buy anything you want. Yeah, but what if I don't want to buy my way to it, right? What if I don't want to hire my way to it? What if I don't want to like work for a living, right? Uh, what if I want to like grow my own vegetables instead of like going to work to earn money to go to the supermarket to buy vegetables so I can eat them or rather go to a restaurant so that the chef can buy vegetables so they can cook them for me and so on and so forth, right? So of all the complex way we could technically have a solution, this, this choice architecture reduces everything to it must be viable and it must be like producible mm -hmm. and in particular it must be like producible at scale and that is that is caused like that, that this is like causing increasing problems that we can only like think in that way right uh, we have an energy crisis especially in europe uh, we have a global climate crisis we have had a pandemic and in every single case it's like we must invest more in this we, i mean we must hire someone to create more product for us uh, we must you know like create a vaccine or a pill uh, rather than change our social behavior for example um in in all cases and and, and i think there in lies the sort of like the fundamental at like the very um bottom layer of how not the very bottom but very close to the bottom of of of, of how we think the, the 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 mass modernism you could call it <laughs> Uh, could be a problem. I think it is a problem. I think it's one of the the, the, the biggest problems, um, and I don't really see any great alternatives to it. I mean, I mean, there's obviously like these like individual efforts, 
with with the with the Renaissance approach and trying to fix it in your own home, and that works really well. But it's hard to figure out how to like roll that out on a societal scale, even in a like community scale. It's hard to get people to go along with you because we're still like a bunch of rare weirdos who with a fascination for learning how to do a lot more stuff ourselves. I've I've never thought about you know the architecture of choice, that concept and how it really runs our lives in a mass scale. And like you said, how we tend to see services as people and people as services. And it's th this, this is a constant, you know, talk of war that there exists between understanding that there is a route to fix it, which has proven to be useful individually, the ERE approach, like you say, and then us trying or people who really walk their talk like you do and those who have read your books and try to practice it, try to deploy it on a mass scale, but it really it's really hard to to do that without people awakening to the fact that this is this system is not working, you know, that the these little cues or red flags that we're noticing more and more increasingly, like the intensity of the climate change Uh, disasters, hurricanes, the tremendous temperature rising that happened in the summer across Europe, all of these little pieces of the puzzle, like you say, the the, the pandemic, the supply shocks, the energy, energy shocks, we just, we haven't really been able to just say, okay, this is, we, we've been quote unquote fortunate, you know, that we, we are still here and we can notice those problems. But we haven't really overcome our notion that these are just externalities and we can quick fix them by injecting money to them or investing more, like you say. The reason we've been able to fix them is, is, is that they've come one at a time. Right. And the world has enough reserve capacity to redirect resources and, and capitalism is essentially the fastest way to do that. Mm -hmm. But if it comes two at a time, Um, like during the pandemic, we were kind of fortunate that nothing really bad happened and happened on, on, on top of that. Because once the, um, like the uh, reserve capital is gone, then it spills out. Yeah. And there, there lies, lies the problem. It, it, uh, and then, and that's where I kind of think we, we need complex solutions, but complexity also costs effort. I mean, it's not like year like what, what I'm trying to do has some kind of like magic quick tip, you know, you just learn these like three things and you can do what I do. I mean, it's like been like an, 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 an a decade long, like self learning process of actually teaching myself all these like adulting skills. Right. Um, so it's, 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 it's ongoing. I mean, but it's not, it's not hard again. It's kind of like you could go back to like the, grandfather in you know, a silent generation and before the people who fought in like World War One, World War Two, they could take care of themselves, right? Um, but they they started learning from like a very early age. You know, like basically from growing up. Uh, same thing with other other cultures, traditional cult cultures, you know, like you have in, in instead of spending, you know, um There's this like theory that the school system is essentially just a daycare center to hold people back to not cause unemployment, right? Yeah. Uh, it's very cynical, like, but that we're literally like extending that we're not we're not giving people better education, we're giving people longer educations. So we are adding more and more people into the system. Now we send everybody to college, right? But I'm I'm sorry to say not everybody is fit for college, right? So instead we lower the levels. Um, yeah, and I don't mean to, to insult too many people, but that's like a systemic problem, essentially. Whereas if, if you go back, uh, like maybe even like a hundred years, if not probably 150 would be more accurate, right? Where, where people go out in apprenticeships, uh, you know, like starting at age like six or something, or you have, um, captains on schooners driving across the Atlantic, a boat across the Atlantic. Uh, like a tall tall ship, you know, like three masted at age 18. It's like, wow, right? I mean, 
today you know you'd probably be like you'd have to like go through like a career ladder of so many years yeah. and it's the same route right i mean on the on, on the flip side you know like going going back to the choice architecture when it works it's really convenient right you don't really have to know much you can do a whole lot of things that you otherwise would 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 not be able to i mean i know that from like making things myself it's a lot harder than it looks actually compared to just like ordering online with amazon prime or something you know like you get you know same day delivery uh building something on your own is is, is much i mean it, it it definitely takes take takes longer you know because you have to do the entire process you have to know every single step there was this idea that you mentioned in college which really i think it ties up the previous three questions that i that i asked you on you know how to leverage your technologies and how the dangers of associating people as products rather than just ends of themselves. It's just it's really interesting that we've created this massive system also of of keeping the supply chain of people, you know, running through the circuits of life. You know, the tier one is you born, tier two you go to school. You know, we 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 have these massive systems to to do that funnel of processing. Mm -hmm. And how we can leverage technology also goes into that same equation is that not entirely, we, maybe we'll, we'll all be able to find apprenticeships, but we'll be able to leverage, you know, my computer, your computer, everyone's computer to just understand that college is not built personalized, personalized for me, for my own ideas. And if I understand that, I can create building blocks to what I want to do in the world with technology. And like you say, YouTube, free resources. Um, there's a lot of things that we can we can tackle on that. I idea. think um, I think maybe. I mean, I, I definitely don't want to go, and I'm probably going to get a lot of like kickback for this, but I'm not going to go in the direction of we should all like homeschool or teach ourselves or do our own research. Uh, research. I think that would be a be a disaster. I mean, in, in those communities, I think they're a little blind to sort of like the failures of that mm -hmm. approach, which tend to end up in the public school system, you know, having not learned anything at, uh, from, from being homeschooled, uh, ending, I mean, even like as a sort of like a self-taught, I mean, for those who don't know, I had a PhD in theoretical physics, so I'm like I've basically done as much education as, as, I, as, I, as I possibly could in order to get employed somewhere. Um, but even like if you are self-taught in something, the, the main problem is that you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And then the, the benefit of like a formal education is that someone actually knew how to like fill out the blanks and at least present you with like a, a, a complete framework, whereas like the internet they tend to send you down rabbit holes. Yeah. And those can be like terrible rabbit holes. Um, like the, the modern education system was not something that like came about. I mean, it's not just something you get like that, snap, snap. Um, it was it was built specifically for mass production and, and getting people to show up at factories on a regular basis. So it was like training people to think of themselves as like productive items, cogs in the machine, if you will, and, and really feel sort of like strongly identify themselves with their job and, and 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 their career and once you do that then then you're going to show up for work each day even if you have enough money you know like then they focus it's not on like well like today i need you know like to you know i need five bucks because i need to buy bread and uh, buy some cheese at the bacon i don't make cheese myself but i grow all my vegetables right but from the factory owner's perspective you know they have all this stuff in invested in machines and capital, you know, like that's been like a huge, hugely expensive undertaking, you know, so you can't like make that go to waste. So if workers, you know, the people actually operating, they just sort of like show up randomly. Uh, that's a huge problem. Like, so you have to go back, you, the people went, they went back to the school system and, and specifically designed people so you can, as commodities practically, so you can take, oh, he's a random student, you know, we don't really care what you learned, but we, do care that you've been trained to, you know, like sit still for eight hours a day and write things that we tell you. Um, so, so we can quickly retrain you, you know, like a few months of retraining, we can put you in, in, in to operate this, yeah. this machine. And where I'm driving with all this is like going back to where we understand. I mean, we're like 
eight billion people on the on the planet now, right? And yeah. that's 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 essentially that's that's like um, eight times too many if we every, everybody wants to live like you know like an expensive life, like uh, people who are watching this podcast and everybody will be doing, right? Um, so we need to have something both. We need to have some kind of like organized complexity, and 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 therein lies the problem because we don't really have people who are used to thinking in terms of complexity as individuals, and we don't have it in in, in communities. So we have nothing to organize and no idea of how to organize it. Wow, <laughs> that's that's. I'm nice. slowly ruining your world here. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> you, I think. You're spot on because it's just, you know, the awakening that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. We're here a certain period of time, you know, in this time and space, hopefully 120 years, knock on wood, you know, we, we live here and we experience life and we shouldn't think of ourselves as products like like we, we just discussed because there's so much more to life. There's so much more to to do here and if we could also think of how we're not really part of the clock you know we're, we're we're not really part of the productization of of society we can uh, maximize I, i'm i'm going to say maximize our time here and understanding how the world works like you clearly do jacob you know can yield better outcomes in terms of you know, enjoying and, 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 and truly, truly having a better experience here on earth for, for most people. So you understand wealth and you understand finances and, you know, we have these notions in our capitalist society of, of wealth, you know, people who are wealthy are people who own a lot of things and have a huge net income and they're extremely rich. But for you, Jacob, what is the real meaning of wealth? Who for you really is a wealthy person? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, and so there's like four, four, four qualities, right? There's uh, like wealthy and then there's broke or bankrupt. So wealthy is the opposite of being broke or bankrupt. And then there's rich and poor, mm -hmm. which, which is sort of like just depending on like what you're, turnovers so so to me like well being wealthy is essentially yeah not being broke or poor it's an ability to meet your obligations but they they're different kinds of wealth right it, i mean we normally just talk about money right so if you if you're financially wealthy you know you can pay any any bill or fine or buy any product you want within reasons to me i mean it's not like <laughs> i consider myself wealthy but i can only buy maybe like two lamborghinis at my current present you know like i can't buy an entire fleet um then there's like if you're like physiologically healthy right you're wealthy you're you're, you're healthy you 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 can actually get up get off a couch without like moaning about it uh, you can walk around you can run you can play basketball um you can outrun a dog and jump over a fence um technically wealthy you can like fix any problem or well, not any problem you can fix a lot of problems right you're not like stuck just because your your bicycle tire is flat then that would correspond to being like technically bankrupt um <laughs> socially wealthy i mean you have you know a lot of people who look out for you and you look out for a lot of people um so i, I would say that they're like different kinds of Of, of of wealth and they also kind of like build build up that they they, they, they they have like different degree they're different degrees of wealth as you know like just being able to like take care of the bare minimum but also like ultimately being able to 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 uh to help other people along or like spread your wealth essentially yeah like you say it's a so, multifaceted yeah right yeah 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 it's really interesting because yeah. like Like you said, it's we usually think for like on a first the first instance that wealth is really always associated with with money, but there's a lot of yeah. different areas and and I think I think actually that people don't really tend to appreciate that other people might have a different kind of wealth. Um, I think um, I mean 
it's 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 still a thing. Uh, but if if we can get like political for like two minutes, right? Uh, that was, <laughs> There was like a lot of talk, you know, like with the rural poor, right? Why don't they, and then the complaint from the cities is like, why don't they just move to the city and get a job, right? Because then they can make money, right? Why do they stay there? Uh, the point is that the rural communities have a lot of social wealth. They all know each other. They rely on each other. So moving away from that would essentially be like, setting fire to a huge bunch of wealth. I mean, you used to have like social wealth, no money wealth. And if you leave, you have now nothing, right? So that creates like a huge mode in terms of actually doing this, like, well, just go to college and get it, get an education, right? Um, so that's like under, under, underappreciated by this model we have where we only see wealth as like how many dollars, what's, what's your net worth? I mean, that's like, like more net worth and they don't, Neither do they easily translate well into each other. Like you can't buy your friends, right? And your friends probably are not going to give you money. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're probably not going to give you that much money anyway. Um, but even worse than that, they're not really seen or appreciated. If you have one, you take, I mean, you probably have it because you're really into that kind of wealth. And that probably means you ignore the other ones. And that's kind of, I think, with, with, the, with the area, at least the respect that there are many of them and that the more you have, the, the, be the better you are able to, like, see the connections between them. Mm. And so yeah. you can, like, look for these, like, non-productized non -product solutions in your, in your space. Yeah, I, I really like how in ERE, in your book, you identify seven categories, you know, seven fields of, of life and physiological, economical, intellectual, emotional, social, technical, and ecological. And it's really interesting to see that there's levels of wealth for each, each one of those, you know, there's, there's levels of, of understanding of each one of those. And, and these yield different results, these different, different outcomes, but also insights. And Jacob, for you, each one of these a field, which one would be the most important, you know, if you had to s choose one from scratch, starting your journey as an year E <laughs> uh, individual, which one would be better to, to start off in each of it's actually, It's very interesting with that one. When I wrote the book, it's almost uh, 10, 10, 10 to 15 years. I just started writing it like uh, almost 15 years ago. And there's, there's one there that wasn't mentioned. Which one? Spiritual. Spiritual. It's not there, right? Because I did not recognize that as a thing at all back then. Wow. Uh, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, it's just like, again, you know, coming from the science side, why would you need that? Um, or rather, it's sort of like taken care of by uh, scientific understanding. Um, but I mean, in, in, in terms of like which one, um, I would, I mean, it's a little bit like asking which, like, which, um, what should I study in college, right? And And then the standard answer is, um, especially where, where I grew up in, in Danish society, uh, was you should just follow your passion, whatever you're interested in. Yeah. And I think that's like a terrible answer. Uh, at, at least it's sort of like inconsiderate. It's just sort of like very um, in, in favor of, of, of the system or in favor of making people happy in, the, in sort of like the short run. So like my actual answer for that would be like, you should first look at what, what, where your talents are. So even if like you're super passionate about like sports or something, but if you're no good at, if you don't like have the athletic, you know, capacity for it, like being really into something you're not good at, it's not going to be great for you. Um, then I would say, look, look, after, after sort of like considering the talent thing, you know, like consider whether it's useful both to yourself and to others. So it might be like, say, like I'm like super talented at uh, like uh, anthropology or something. But then it turns out that society has not, doesn't really have much use for it, right? So I should probably not really spend most of my time on that. So you basically consider, consider the strategy outside your personal interests, but also the sort of like the broader in interest of, of community, society, nation, mm -hmm. the world. And then out of that list, which is probably still pretty long, and then consider the passion, like what would I have the most most fun with? Hmm. Um, 
so that, that's that's in terms of starting starting with with just one of them um i i would say that um they they kind of translate into each other so they're different like levels of learning right as as as, as we've talked about um and going deeper is is actually kind of tricky because the kind of learning changes so um in, in in terms of like mental development if 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 you will we we tend to start with like rote learning um concrete like if it's in front of me you know like i can do one two three four five and i i learn the multiplication table you know like that's all memorization the technical learning right um and then at the next level there would be something like formal level x plus y i mean i'm just doing the equivalent that's the same thing in any other field right and then ultimately there would be like uh, you you start thinking of all these formal constructions in terms of systems and that's when you start being creative so what i usually equivalize that with is is um an undergraduate degree for the for the technical stuff you'll sort of like learn the basics of the field and if you put some put put something you know like a spreadsheet in front of an accountant they can like work with that and then there's like the mechanical uh, stage of the master's degree um where, where, where you get the freedom to to pick your solution method, you know, like here's a broken car, you know, you can probably fix it in three different ways, but it's up to you to fix it, right? Mm. And then the the, the research uh, a PhD sort of like level, or if you will, where you go into um, the systems that underlie the different ways of the different solution methods. Is essentially, you'll be, you'll be able to like create literally new solution or new compute computational methods new solution methods and it's it's hard to see that there's like a next step if you haven't been to it already but once you've been been to it and see sort of like the general framework of how this learning progression goes it can be translated into all the other fields so as an overall strategy, and maybe I'm just sort of like talking my book or my personal autobiography here, yeah, that's like a danger, right? But like pick something and get really good at it, but then try to learn everything else as well. Hmm. Uh, so um, rather than sort of like dabbling around in, in, in the center. Right. If that makes sense. So it's, it's good to have like one formal education still but also extend it around. I mean, I think that's like the real problem with not with it. I don't know if there's something like wrong with the educational system in that sense, but like almost everybody I know, they basically stopped learning when they, when they graduated, it's like, they never picked up another book. Wow. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, I mean, sort of like, <laughs> okay, that's saying it a little bit too extreme, but it's something like the average, I think in in for, for US numbers or like having looked into publishing and writing books as a way of reaching people that doesn't work very well actually, <laughs> but it, it's something like one or two books per year on average, but it's like five percent as the Pareto distribution is like really really strong, so like I think it's ninety five or something like five percent of people read ninety five percent of the books, so there's like a bunch of super readers. And then there's like most people touch less than one book a year. Wow. Uh, and I'm not saying books are the only way to learn, of course, but like it, it just kind of stops and, and it's weird, right? I mean, it's at least it's weird to me, but I like learning. So, yeah, no, it is, it, it, yeah. it is weird. It is. <laughs> and, I mean, well, I mean, it's normal, right? It's super normal. It's the weird thing is that it's normal. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious, Jacob, you know, you, you mentioned the, an eighth category which is spiritual how would you how would you begin writing that chapter if you had to write a chapter about the spiritual journey uh well that's a that's a very good question i mean i'm probably not like super qualified for that um i have i have sort of been been reading into like um like the whole ken wilbur transpersonal bands of meditation stuff so it would probably be somewhat secular in approach uh, creating like a giant map of things is, is what I've been been looking into. Um, 
Uh, that's, I mean, I usually just map everything out. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure it would actually help me super much to have it for myself because I kind of realize, uh, like, at least from my perspective, it would still just remain uh, sort of like a human construct or personal construct that could basically be seen in multiple ways. Um, that comes comes from this whole physics background. We all, all we all about like creating frameworks and how this might work and how this might work in 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 in, in different uh, different ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, for formal, I think for formal, like I, I would say, like spiritual uh, religious approaches, the great thing about them is that they actually come with like a complete framework for how to what what to do with your life. Whereas from my perspective where i just say well you got to learn everything you know like and then you'll figure out how the world works uh, but then it's kind of like up to you good luck with that right um <laughs> so it doesn't it doesn't provide that right um and the same thing with you if you go to um your 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 sort of like your standard american careerism game you know like the american dream it's all about becoming rich and buying everything you can possibly desire right and then retire that's the sort of like the standard definition of success yeah it's it's hard to say what the definition of success with ere is mm. i mean for me uh so so like within the standard approach like within fire success is that you retire you become financially independent and then you retire and then that's like you you made it essentially but for me that's just the starting line uh and i think it should be the starting line it's like okay, you reached independence, like you actually managed to crawl your way back to the starting line. Now you can start your real race, but I don't know whether like the real race is is gonna, is gonna end. So just like picking these big problems, let's solve all the problems in the world, you know, like let's fix the meta crisis. Um, yeah. But I mean that 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 might very well be sort of like the um, the greatest challenge of the twenty second century. I'm I'm hoping that you do write that chapter in spirituality. It would be really really interesting. <laughs> Yeah. to read it and you know wrapping wrapping up jacob uh there is this question that i really like that perhaps maybe it happened to you or didn't happen to you that maybe a piece of advice that was given to you throughout your life really sparked your interest in ere or something related mm -hmm. to that but what is one piece of advice you remember until today that have that made the most impact in you um not none or uh, not 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 a, not applicable i think i mean i don't really remember things that way i think the uh it's like i can't really point to something that well so i guess a piece of advice this is a really good piece of advice so i'm just gonna like change my life on that I think. <laughs> um i mean what changed my trajectory from being this sort of like uh star trekky techno optimistic astrophysicist wannabe to what i'm doing now was uh, learning new fields um so uh, when, I, when I went to grad school, I essentially moved to Switzerland and ended up with a big computer in a dorm room where I essentially spent my, my evenings there, you know, doing extra research and then the days doing my actual research. And I learned about ecology and finance, which had like never been taught to me. And so these were sort of like outside the aquarium fields for me. Hmm. And so knowing about those, it was sort of, it was really like shocking to me. It's like, Everything I know is wrong, or rather, I have, I don't see the big, big picture anymore. So it was sort of like a minor crisis, actually, of, of trying to rewrite everything I thought I knew into something like, okay, maybe it's, this is the way to, to, to go now. And so maybe uh, if I can give a piece of advice, it is actually to sort of like step outside your field and learn other things, because what you know is probably not the whole thing. I mean, you can pick basically almost any anything. I mean, even like the difference between working in wood with machine tools compared to working with hand tools. It's a little bit of a paradigm shift. Right. Every, everything, everything you like knew, thought you knew is not going to work over there. That's there lies the problem. And now you're like starting from scratch. Yeah. So, so stepping, stepping out, same thing with like uh, going from programming and like Fortran to programming in C++. It's like, pfft. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. step outside the best piece of advice is like to try something completely different um but doing it in, the second piece of advice is to uh, do it in a semi-formal way not not down the youtube rabbit holes <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's just, thank you thank you for that and you know jacob your 
your ideas and uh, that's, I'm going to re-listen to this conversation <laughs> multiple times too, is that your idea is to yield uh, an opportunity for me and for our listeners to, you know, to explore the possibilities of doing more with our potential in a way and how to how to improve upon self-reliance our systems hopefully and hopefully this becomes a, a system like you say that's a spiral upward spiral that impacts more people so thank you again for joining me i really appreciate it and i will keep in touch you know me i will keep in touch so <laughs> thank you so much for joining me again and we'll stay in touch yeah